Hello and welcome back to my video series on solving the mystery of dualism. Just want to mention that the material that I'll be covering in this video series is basically a synopsis of that which you'll find in my book, Evolving Towards the Truth, A Guide for Searchers. You can find links to my book at my website, jeffkosmoski.com, and you can find the book directly at amazon.com. In the previous video, I brought up this concept of a chasm of dualism. It's my contention that what's prevented us from building an explanatory bridge across this chasm is not a lack of understanding of the elements and details on the physical side of the chasm, but a lack of understanding or sophistication in our understanding of what's occurring on the mental side of the chasm. I also mentioned these two epistemological hurdles that have uh, prevented man from making any progress. Um, and more specifically, I mentioned that what's caused these epistemological hurdles is evolution, meaning that the way the human mind has evolved has impeded our ability to think about uh, this topic of dualism in an uh, accurate and correct way. So the purpose of this video is to try to hit this first epistemological hurdle. And to do that, we're going to take this journey, we're going to retrace the steps that the human mind typically takes as it tries to uh, make progress against this mystery of dualism. In order to expose this first hurdle, we're actually going to begin our uh, journey on the physical side of the chasm. Now, I should mention that there's uh, an incredible amount of information and uh, knowledge to be had on the physical side, and the intent here is not to cover all these uh, details and all the uh, depth that it would actually require. Rather, the intent of this video is just to demonstrate the major highlights or stepping stones along the way. So I want to apologize up front. I'm going to fly through this, this uh, information very quickly. Um, the motivated viewer is certainly uh, welcome to uh, take his own time uh, discovering and learning about these topics as uh, he or she sees fit. So without further ado, uh, let's begin the investigation on the physical side of the chasm and see if we can't hit this first epistemological hurdle. As people typically begin their investigation into uh, dualism, they uh, normally begin with an investigation into brains. That is, as they try to discover the uh, mysterious process that uh, somehow converts physical activity into mental activity, the most logical place to begin is with brains. And one of the first things that uh, you'll discover is that there's just an incredible number of facts about brains. Essentially, all animals have brains. Insects have brains, worms have brains, fish have brains, and of course mammals and humans have brains. There's a type of structure to brains. They're not just a uh, homogeneous blob of identical cells. Uh, much like the uh, digestive system, there's a type of uh, modularity to um, brains. Uh, mammalian brains start with a uh, interior core of a uh, brain stem, and this is surrounded by a uh, midbrain or a limbic system, and this is further surrounded by a cortex. Now, each one of these uh, major modules is then further subdivided into submodules, and each one of these submodules has its own basic area of uh, responsibility and specialty. Brains consist of an incredible number of cells. Um, there are several types of cells, but uh, neurons are the uh, main cell of interest to us. The human brain is believed to consist of uh, over 10 billion uh, neurons, and each one of these neurons is in uh, intimate communication with other neurons. Uh, some neurons are believed to be in contact with up to as many as 10,000 other neurons. Um, some of the brain is concerned primarily with more mundane activities like uh, regulation of body temperature, heart rate, and hormones. And some of the brain is uh, concerned exclusively with uh, muscle control and uh, motor control. But uh, we're not really concerned about those types of activities here. We're more concerned about uh, consciousness, uh, sensory experience, and uh, qualia. So the next logical place to investigate in our journey here would be the uh, sensing systems. Um, and as we investigate these, we find there's a type of uh, architectural similarity between them, whether we're talking about the sense of smell or the sense of taste or the sense of hearing or touch. This uh, general architecture uh, consists of three different types of cells or neurons. There's uh, sensing neurons, uh, transmitting neurons, and uh, reporting neurons. Uh, the sensing neurons are basically very specialized types of cells that respond to specific stimuli, whether we're talking about uh, cells on the surface of our tongue or up in our nasal passages or on our skin. They basically detect these very uh, specific types of stimuli. And when they do, they become active, and they then um, stimulate uh, the downstream transmitting neurons, and those in turn then further stimulate the uh, reporting neurons in the brain. As we continue our investigation, uh, we soon discover that the real key players here are probably these uh, reporting neurons in the brain. And these reporting neurons don't just uh, occur hither and yon, but they're actually uh, organized into what's referred to as maps. This diagram here probably provides uh, one of the best examples of how these maps work. 
rats have these uh, facial whiskers that um, act uh, essentially as feelers, so that when any one of these uh, whiskers uh, becomes deflected or whatnot, it tends to stimulate the uh, reporting neurons at the base of the whisker. And this reporting neuron then uh, further stimulates a downstream transmitting neuron that then uh, stimulates um, neurons in these maps. And you can see in this case, there's uh, three different maps, one in the uh, brainstem, one in the uh, midbrain area, and then a third map in the, uh, the cortex. And so the idea is that um, for every one of these uh, uh, facial whiskers, there's a, uh, a small cluster of uh, reporting neurons that uh, directly correspond to it. So these uh, reporting neurons in these uh, columns is our next area of interest. And it turns out that it isn't the case that just a single neuron fires in the brain um, for uh, the movement of a single rat whisker. Uh, rather, there's um, a column, and these columns or little groups of uh, neurons uh, consist of um, approximately 100 uh, neurons. So these 100 neurons all become active at one time when any single whisker gets uh, deflected. And the same basic architecture applies to all of our sensing modes, whether we're talking about uh, touch, uh, smell, or taste, or sight, or hearing. The idea being that these uh, reporting neurons occur in maps, and there's uh, several different maps uh, for each mode in the brain, and uh, any one of these uh, maps consists of uh, columns of reporting neurons that all become active at any one time. So as the human mind continues its investigation on the physical side of the chasm of dualism, the next logical question is, so what is it about these reporting neurons that uh, might give them the ability to uh, produce my uh, sensory experiences or my qualia? There are basically two uh, features that differentiate uh, neurons or nerve cells from um, all the other cells in the body. Uh, the first is their shape. As you can see by these diagrams, they basically have uh, rather long and spindly appearances. They've got a, uh, an input end, um, which consists of these kind of plant-like uh, dendrites. And then on their output end, they have this long uh, spindly axon. And then this ends in some other uh, small plant-like appendages um, that lead to these uh, synap synapses or synaptic bulbs. So that's their, uh, their basic difference in shape. Their, uh, the other uh, major uh, differentiating feature is that they can fire. This is a term that uh, neurologists use to describe their behavior. And they don't actually um, emit flames or sparks, but what they uh, do is um, propagate electrical charge down the length of their axons in a repetitive manner. And as the human mind would be curious to learn more about this uh, firing phenomenon, it would encounter uh, diagrams like these. And these diagrams basically depict the uh, rather special ability of the uh, cell wall of the neuron to be able to shuttle and move uh, charged particles or charged ions back and forth through the cell wall. And by virtue of rather a choreographed ability to do this, it can uh, shuttle this electrical charge down the uh, length of the axon. And this is where we encounter the first epistemological hurdle. I think for most people, as they view this activity occurring at the axonal cell wall, tend to view it as nothing more than the movement of hard little inanimate physical bits of matter. And yes, these little bits of matter have some kind of an electrical charge associated with them. But the question arises, how can the movement of nothing more than inanimate little bits of matter possibly produce something as decidedly unphysical and immaterial as qualia? Qualia such as the taste of a lime, the smell of a rose, or the color purple. It just seems entirely incomprehensible, incongruous, and absurd. What's interesting about this uh, observation or this uh, feeling of uh, incredulity is that it was basically stated by uh, Gottfried Leibniz uh, approximately 300 years ago. Uh, Leibniz was a uh, mathematician and a famous philosopher who also um, had a uh, general interest in the issue of dualism. And at that time, he said this, Suppose that there be a machine, the structure of which produces thinking, feeling, and perceiving. Imagine this machine enlarged, but preserving the same proportion so that you could enter it as if it were a mill. This being supposed, you might visit its inside. But what would you observe there? Nothing but parts which push and move each other, and never anything that could explain perception. So this is the first hurdle. How can we possibly explain how the uh, movement of physical matter could possibly produce qualia? Regardless of how small these inanimate particles are, or how many of them there are, or how fast they're moving, how can it be that the mere movement of physical matter could possibly produce something as decidedly non-physical and immaterial as qualia? In the next video, I'll describe a way around this uh, first hurdle. Um, and in a subsequent video, I'll go into a greater detail as to why this is actually an epistemological hurdle. And again, I apologize for uh, going as quickly as I did through this material, uh, but you can find it covered in much greater depth and detail in my book, Evolving Towards the Truth, A Guide for Searchers. I'm Jeff Kosmoski. Thanks for watching.